I have a confession to make. Brace yourself, and please try to remember I've wanted to create a safe space on my channel free of judgement. Well, I mean, free of me being the target of judgement, I'll judge others with abandon and feel no shame. But I can't hide it any longer, I, I, I must confess to you all that I am not a Disney child. I'm not. I don't have a favourite sidekick, I don't know half the songs, I've never even been to Disney World. Now I recognise that to some people, not having an inherent deep-seated love for Disney is close to heresy, which is why I'm not going to compound this by telling you I also don't really care about Halloween. Oh, the truth is, there are some Disney movies that I just haven't seen, and up until about a week and a half ago, one of those was 1989's the Little Mermaid. How, Dan? How is that possible? Well, because the video on loop in my house when I was a child was Grease. I'm telling you, we'd go together like Rama Lama Lama Gadigadi Ding Da Dong four times a week. The weird thing was, it was my little brother's choice. I wanted to watch Gladiators. And so began the mystery of how I became the musical theatre kid, and he is a rugby coach who worked in a microbrewery. I digress. The point is, until late May, all I knew of Ariel was her colour scheme and her alarmingly large side fringe. But I grew up in the 90s, and the 90s were an impossible place to be without some awareness of Disney. For instance, I had not seen The Hunchback of Notre Dame, but I absolutely owned all the Happy Meal tie-in toys. I did see, and Loki have a crush on, Pocahontas. And the one film I did devour with alacrity was Hercules, because that shit was fierce. And also I had a crush on Hercules. So I do have that fondness for Disney. If nothing else, I appreciate the cultural contribution and the artistic merit. When I think of Hollywood, I think of the mouse. But on days when I need a little bit of comfort and I'm hiding under my duvet, I will look for an episode of Friends, whereas some of my generation will reach for The Little Mermaid. I just don't have that same connection. And over the past several years, I've found the glut of live-action remakes put forth by the studio to be underwhelming and a bit confused. So imagine my surprise when I went to see the new live-action Little Mermaid the other day and found it to be fine, actually. I thought the 52 minutes they added to the runtime amounted to precisely zero minutes of substance, and the pursuit of realism was a major downgrade to the majestic fantasy of Ariel's underwater world. But on the whole, I had a perfectly pleasant experience at the cinema. Not as pleasant as the guy sat in front of me who was dancing along to Under the Sea. I have a feeling his evening seaweed was always greener. That said, in the weeks leading up to the film's release, and in the tube on the way home from the pictures, one question was rattling around my head. What is a Disney movie in 2023? Because Disney movie is a genre all to itself, right? I mean, we all have that crystal clear idea that so many of my generation have, that cultural creative identity that's baked into the phrase a Disney movie. In a world where they're gobbling up studios left, right and centre, and they've got a money printing machine called Marvel, are Disney still the enchanting powerhouse that they once were? That is my question for the day, but before we plummet headlong into existentialism, I'd just like to say a quick thank you to this video's sponsor. Sponsorship? Dan? Thanks, main video Dan. This week's video is very kindly sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery extravaganza that we know I've been using for ages now. Each week, you pick which meals you fancy from an array of options, vegetarian, family style, rapid cook, and very many more, and then they get delivered straight to your door. Didn't intend that rhyme. You're welcome, HelloFresh. All you have to do is open the box, pick what you'd like to eat that night, and get cooking. It really is that simple. In the box, you get exact ingredients, so there's no food waste, which is something I particularly love, and each dish has its own recipe card with easy to follow, clear, picture instructions, and all you have to do is follow them. It's as simple as that. I'm quite a confident cook as it is, but what surprised me in the time I've been using HelloFresh is how much more confident it's made me in trying new flavour combinations and actually cooking for myself, having the discipline to make myself a delicious meal every night, because normally I haven't had the time to go shopping and I'll just grab something quick on the way home. This way I can go about my day safe in the knowledge that I'll walk in the door, already have all my ingredients and make myself a delicious home-cooked meal. And it's fully customizable. so if you've got a busy week and you think you might want more dinners and leftovers for lunch the next day, you can just increase the number of meals and serving sizes you get. Or if you know you're going to be away, you can just pause the delivery for that week. It works to your schedule. Do whatever you want. I'm not the boss of you. If you'd like to give it a go, then boy howdy do I have the deal for you. Be very modern and scan this QR code, or be traditional and enter the code 60DL to get 60% off your first box and 25% off your next eight boxes, which, if I've done my maths right, will take us through to August. Time is a fickle friend. Thank you once again to HelloFresh for the sponsor. I'm gonna go make my tea and then put my feet up in front of a live-action remake. Back to main video, Dan.
Let's do pub quiz trivia. Disney's first live action remake of one of their animated classics was... That's right, it was the 1994 Jungle Book, which was followed quickly by 1996's 101 Dalmatians, starring Glenn Close as Cruella de Vil and featuring, the rarest of things, mostly accurate London geography. However, the real catalyst for these live action remakes was the success of 2010's Alice in Wonderland, directed by Tim Burton, which made over a billion dollars at the box office and launched an unfortunate amount of Wonderland-themed student films, of which I was in several. The success of the film encouraged the Disney higher-ups to open their vault, and more crucially, their purse strings. They greenlit a number of remakes and adaptations of their beloved hits, soon followed Maleficent in 2014 and Cinderella in 2015. What's interesting about these films is that they aren't remakes per se, as much as they are individual films in their own right. Maleficent is an origin story from the perspective of one of Disney's most iconic villains, and Cinderella was approached with the intent to create a definitive, cinematic version of this classic fairy tale for a whole new generation. But in 2016, Disney released another attempt at a live-action Jungle Book. Directed by Monica's ex-boyfriend Pete, the film took a more direct influence from Disney's original animation, referencing a number of its iconic visuals and several of its most memorable songs. Subsequent live-action remakes from the studio, both both those given theatrical releases and those shoved so deep into the darkest corners of Disney Plus that you'd be forgiven for thinking the Lady in the Tramp remake was actually an SNL sketch, have followed suit, becoming more like cinematic patch updates than definitive films in their own right. And now we've arrived at The Little Mermaid, which is a pivotal film in the history of Disney animation because it kicked off the boom period of the 1990s, which is commonly referred to as the Disney Renaissance. At this stage, I feel like most people know the story of the Disney Renaissance, but for those of you who, you know, watch sports or whatever. Here's a super brief rundown, super brief so that I can spin it out into another video in the future. It's all about the long game. Disney knows. It's the 70s and 80s, Disney are up against it, they call it the Dark Ages, and a bunch of animators are jumping ship. Pun absolutely intended. Mid 80s, Michael Eisner comes in as the new CEO and shifts the entire animation department out of the main studio to make room for live action. Oof. But in their new offices in Glendale, under the leadership of Roy E. Disney, Walt's nephew, there are some modest successes for the animation department. Emboldened by these successes, the company begins production on The Little Mermaid, which is to be treated like a Broadway musical, with music and lyrics by Alan Menken and Howard Ashman. The film comes out in 1989, everybody loves it, breaks all the records, becomes the highest grossing animated film of all time, wins two Oscars, and like a sea witch rising from the deep, Disney animation is back and better than ever. Divine! What's also interesting about this period, I say interesting, it's interesting to me, and certainly as it pertains to the matter of these remakes, is that this is also the period where Disney starts releasing their animated classics on home entertainment. You see, Disney had largely resisted releasing their famous titles on the emerging home video market. Their preferred model was to give their films a Christmas theatrical release every seven years or so. This way, the films would meet an entire new generation of youngsters, then go back into the vault to hibernate ready to start again. The concern was that by having these classics on home entertainment, they would somehow devalue the property, make them less special. Well, the head of home video didn't really agree with that. So he said, please, can I release Pinocchio? And they said, okay. And it sold big. And then they were like, all right, try Sleeping Beauty and it sold bigger. Finally, they gave in and allowed the release of Cinderella on home video to coincide with its theatrical re-release. And they made $180 million, which in today's money is lots. And that was on top of the $30 million the film made from its theatrical release. And here's the stat that's my favourite part of this anecdote. That combined total was bigger than the $200 million that Michael Eisner had put as a value for the entire Disney vault. Obviously because this was the 80s and Wall Street was a documentary, Eisner got dollar signs in his eyes, doubled down on home entertainment, and that's how we got all of those director video sequels in the 90s. Now, I'm positing a theory here, and it is a theory because I haven't fully researched it. It may even have been made elsewhere. I wouldn't know. I was too busy, well, I was too busy doing my rendition of Poor Unfortunate Souls in the shower. But here in this video, I posit my theory that these live action remakes are essentially a natural evolution of this pre-home video theatrical re-release model. I'm assuming that home video has a ceiling. Once you have a copy, only the most passionate fans are gonna go out there and buy the special edition you put on offer. And yes, I do recognize the irony of that given that I'm someone who owns three separate box sets of Friends and still pays for Netflix for the privilege of being able to watch it without having to open any of them. So remaking these films is a great way of getting people to open their wallets for a trip to the movies. You offer diehard fans the opportunity to see their beloved nostalgic childhood classic come to life in a brand new way and they bring their sprogs along and you enchant a whole new generation. Or do you? You see, you can't just copy and paste the movies and give them a photorealistic TikTok filter. <laughs> Is that, do they use filters on TikTok? 
I just want to be relevant. No, if you want these films to stand out on their own, they need to be of our times. You need to give them a little zhuzh, perk them up a bit. From a filmmaker's perspective, I think that's only natural. Art is supposed to reflect the world around us, and The Little Mermaid is 30 years old. 33 years old. Ooh. And so the creative teams behind these films want to tell these classic, beloved tales, but in a way that responds to modern experiences and perspectives. But this manifests, for me at least, in a vague attempt to sort of shoehorn in a message or some form of statement, or take a self-aware jab at the very notion of Disney or fairy tales in such a way that I think lessens the impact of the story. And there's a reason these stories have been told through the centuries to generation after generation and have merited one cinematic adaptation, let alone a whole bunch. But somewhere over the past few years, audiences became cynical, jaded, and self-aware, and so the films created for them followed suit. These Disney princesses weren't just pretty girls in nice dresses, they're pretty girls in nice dresses now with added agency. Oh boy, would you look at all the agency. Girl boss. Um, one small issue. <laughs> it's a noble idea, but one that feels forced and inorganic, and it doesn't take you too long to figure out the reason why, which is that the majority of these movies are written and directed by, oh, what's that, men? Um, so, and on top of that, and I recognise this is just my perspective, but I don't think those original princesses ever were so flimsy. I actually think they're quite powerful. For instance, in Beauty and the Beast, Belle's empathy isn't a feminine weakness that makes her a victim to Stockholm Syndrome. It's a strength that, when offered to the Beast, inspires him to become a better person. The animated films handle these topics in a more subtle narrative way that I think makes it easier for a younger audience to digest while still providing that kind of nuance and complexity and depth that will engage the older audience. I mean, Beauty and the Beast was the first feature film to ever be nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. It's that calibre of film. I'm aware, by the way, that because I haven't seen all of the animated classics, I'm not fully qualified to properly pull at that thread, so I'd love to get your perspective. Please do pop it in the comments. That thought that I just shared kind of came from two places. The first was a conversation with my friend Lydia, who was almost apologetic when she admitted that she found the original Disney princesses like progressive role models, but had a very compelling argument for why that was the case. And I guess growing up as a boy, I didn't really have to hunt for role models so I could pretty much find them wherever I wanted and that included but was not limited to Meg and Hercules. And there's definitely more that I want to explore with that idea but the other side of that thought process came from the marketing around this new Little Mermaid. A lot of time and attention has been spent re-examining the idea that to get what she wants, Ariel gives up her voice, literally silencing herself to get a man. But like, I don't know that we saw the same film because for me, Ariel's fascination, her curiosity with the surface world isn't born out of an obsession with a man. In fact, him and his frankly unfair jawline come into it as like an added bonus. Long before she ever sets eyes on him, she's basically sat floating around her who's it's and what's it's galore singing Kelly Clarkson's Breakaway. Guys, she just wants to spread her wings and learn how to fly. She'll do whatever it takes till she touches the sky, even if whatever it takes is give up her voice to a sea witch for a pair of legs. Also, excuse me for a second, it's not so much Ariel giving up her voice for a man as it is Ursula spotting Ariel's distress, exploiting her vulnerability, and manipulating her into giving up her voice. Don't victim blame. Like I say though, I understand filmmakers trying to come at things from a modern perspective, and I'm willing to give them a little bit of leniency, because as a society, I guess we're still trying to figure out gender roles and expectations and what to do with all of them, so actually maybe that is reflective. We barely know what we're doing any day of the week. And I don't think it's right to say that Disney shouldn't explore these films. Surely as a big studio with these massive tentpole movies, they have a responsibility to provide that kind of representation. And I do feel like I can't have this conversation without acknowledging the racist backlash to Halle Bailey's casting. This is not the video for that conversation, however, once you see the movie, I think it's fair to say she was cast very, very well. What I'm not willing to forgive is the taking of a perfectly paced 82 minute film and adding an extra hour for, oh, I assume the ability to inflate your company's watch time when you speak to your shareholders about Disney Plus. Pay no attention to the runtime of this video. The film adds roughly 52 minutes to the plot, which takes the form of a lot of discussions of trade relations and responsibilities for Prince Eric in an effort to paint the pair of them as kindred spirits. Neither of them are happy being cooped up and they long to be part of a different world. And Eric gets his own song, which gives him the opportunity to prance around the rocks like an exhausted toddler who just wants a nap, and I kept thinking of Piers Brosnan the whole time. And I wonder which song Lin-Manuel wrote. Ooh, how could I possibly guess? The who said what, who does that, yeah, the scattlebutt. And then there's the photorealism of it all. 2016's Jungle Book was widely praised for its groundbreaking visual effects work in bringing the animal characters to life. So Disney doubled down on this with The Lion King, and we see the latest, and frankly, creepiest evolution of this in The Little Mermaid. It's great work, obviously, but 
fish are a bit creepy, and I don't think any of us needed to see haunted, photorealistic flounder in our lives. The pursuit of realism is technically impressive, and I've heard more than one person share their initial sense of excitement over the idea of, look, real mermaids! But in other places, that pursuit of realism does work against some of the magic. And it's here that I started settling back into my take and the question that sparked this whole video, which is, Disney is magic, isn't it? And a large part of its magical charm comes from the use of animation to create the fantastic. The animated animal characters in these films sell the story to you in ways both literal and emotional because the medium allows for imagination. Realism, by definition, is real. Wow, what insight. Realism is not imagined, it's not exaggerated, it's real. A lion doesn't raise its eyebrows and open its mouth in shock, nor does a fish giggle bashfully. King Triton's underwater palace has turned from a magical splash of regal colour into a murky, seaweed-covered rock formation. Under the Sea is a beautiful sequence, but it already was, wasn't it? The original intent of these live-action remakes was to create a telling of classic stories to define them on film for a new generation. I can't help but feel that the latter attempts to transpose the films in a more literal but expanded sense are missing something. Part of the joy of Disney animation is that the films are fantastic entertainment for kids, bright colours, big characters, great music, while also being laced with comedy and nuance and complexity that can be appreciated by older audiences. It's engaging for children and their parents alike. But ultimately, with the pursuit of realism, with the baggier runtime favoured by these big tentpole blockbusters, and with the confusing messages in place of subtlety and complexity, you kind of don't engage your core audiences in the same way. I think the crux of my question comes down to this, and I ask it directly to you, the Disney adult watching at home. Yes, I see you. Thank you for being here. You are accepted and valid. On a sick day, when you're curled up in bed and you're feeling sorry for yourself, or when your anxiety is peaking and you just need something to ground you, or when you just want something nostalgic to escape you from the hell zone we currently live in, are you scrolling through Disney Plus for this? Or this. I don't think there is a wrong answer when it comes to art, it is subjective and that's how I end up with Monster in Law as one of my favourite films. But, I think if we're honest with ourselves, most of us are going to say this. And if that's the case, how can these be successful in the pursuit of being a Disney movie? And so for all the box office takings, all the merchandise sales, what is a Disney movie in 2023?